Hope everyone's doing well. I came across a book tag that I felt compelled to do. Um, it was a history book tag created uh, by a group of people on YouTube who collaborated together. Uh, Ghost Reader, Triumphal Reads, a couple books, and Book Shenanigans worked together to make this tag. As a historian, um, I, I just I enjoy, I enjoyed reading or watching everybody's videos on it. Uh, no one invited me to do this tag, um, but I decided to crash crash the party anyway. So um, I just thought it was really interesting and I wanted to contribute. So hopefully that's okay. Um, the first question on this history book tag is what first got you into history? Uh, when I was a little boy, my mom would take me and my sister to the small town um, public library uh, at least once a week during the summer, uh, particularly when we were out of school and even before school started. And she would take us to check out books in the children's section, but I almost never made it to the children's section because right outside of the children's section was the history section. And I would always stop there and pick up a history book for whatever reason, I don't know. The pictures just were uh, so interesting. I couldn't even read, I remember the, this, distinctly I couldn't read but I could look at the pictures and um, I would pick up a book on World War II I remember distinctly looking at a picture of the square mile in London being bombed by the the Nazi Luftwaffe during the Blitz and all the smoke and fire and it just blew my mind um, at a young age how war could happen and how people could do this sorts of things to each other. It was really a formative moment that kind of laid a, a seed in my brain, I guess, a little bit. That didn't come to fruition until I was about 22 years old or so. Finishing up uh, college, I got to go to live and work in uh, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan for a year in between my junior and senior years. Um, I worked there at a school teaching PE uh, with other groups of people from my college who were working in other schools too. And while we were there, uh, we took a tour of the Karak Castle in Karak, Jordan. This is a Crusader castle. Uh, as these images sort of show, they were from um, the Crusades and uh, Christian crusaders from Europe built this castle and held it um, for many years uh, and we toured it. We spent the whole day there and I remember uh, looking around and just being amazed being from small town Michigan you never felt like you, history would ever you would ever get to catch up with history. Nothing ever happened in small town America but here even though it was like a thousand years later, it seemed like I could still connect with the past, being in a place where incredible historical and tragic moments uh, took place. And so sitting in this castle right up here, as you can see in this image, um, in the, the center of where the, the sort of marketplace and the, where the, of, the, of the castle and the headquarters of the castle on this wall here, I sat up on that wall and I stared around and I decided right then and there that I wanted to be a historian. I even a few days later wrote a letter to my parents. I just recently read this letter a few years ago and uh, reminded me that this was the time period when I wanted to be a history. So I find this kind of fascinating because I have photographic image uh, proof of the moment when <laughs> I wanted to be a historian. The second question in this tag is, uh, what is your favorite history book or author? It's an impossible question to answer. Uh, there's just so many good things. But I thought what I would share with you is the one that really um, turned me on to uh, reading and writing history in graduate school. Um, it's a book that um, is academic, but I think it's really a fascinating book. Um, for um, public consumption as well. Maybe if you're not an expert on the 1300s France, I think you still might enjoy this book. It's uh, Montaigu by the author Emmanuel Leroy Ladry, 
I remember reading this book in graduate school, and um, I, it, it just blew my mind. Um, what this is is a book written uh, from Inquisition interviews or um, torture, <laughs> uh, torture uh, chambers, and um, priests in uh, 1300s rural France went to the village of Montaillou, and there were a lot of heretics there, including uh, priests who was preaching heretical things about Christianity and was an incredible womanizer as well. And the um, Catholic Church um, interviewed all the people in this village, and what uh, Lottery was able to do with these uh, first-hand accounts, basically, is he was able to almost literally reconstruct the village of Montaillou. So this is what historians would call um, a micro-history. It's a history of a tiny little village. Um, that's all it's concerned with is um, a very close-up view of, the, of this village. And from these very in-depth interviews, uh, Lottery is able to, like, he's, it's a history, but he tells it in a way that it's almost like a fiction, like a novel. Uh, it's an incredibly well-written book. Um, it feels like fiction, um, even though it is a history. And um, that book uh, really just floored me. I didn't know that you could do that with history when I read it. And uh, I've always wanted to emulate that as best I can. Question number three, what is your most anticipated history book coming out or that you haven't read yet? For me, that's an easy one. Uh, it has come out, but I haven't been able to read it yet. It's uh, David Blight, who is a historian at Yale. Um, he has, um, I think this year, or late last year maybe, uh, his b latest books, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. It's a Pulitzer Prize winner. It's supposed to be incredibly brilliant. David Blight is one of my favorite historians. I think he's one of the best historians that we have in the U.S. at the moment. Um, and I desperately want to read this book. I've read other books by Blight, but this one um, I think is going to be really good, and um, I'm looking forward to that one. Number four, what is your favorite time period? What book do you want to read or have read about it? So my time period is basically from the Civil War to the Second World War. That's the period that I specialize in. So there's two books that cover this time period that I've read recently that just have blown me away. The first one covers the early part of the time period that I'm interested in by Stephen Hahn, A Nation Without Borders, The United States and the World in the Age of Civil Wars from 1830 to 1910. That's interesting, right? Because he's saying the age of civil wars go all the way up to 1910. That's sort of interesting. And then the second book that has really influenced me sort of at the second or the later part of my time period is this one by Adam Tews. Um, the Great, uh, the Deluge, The Great War, America, and the Remaking of the Global Order, 1916 to 1931. Uh, both of these historians are phenomenal historians. Uh, I read these books, as you can see, they're pretty thick. This is Tuz's The Deluge and Hans' A Nation Without Borders. Uh, these books are worth reading every single word because it seems like on every page there's a new thesis and a, a, a new way of looking at um, at the past. Um, it's phenomenal what these historians have been able to do. Stephen Hahn basically talks about series of civil wars, um, not only military wars but reconstruction and economics um, as part uh, within the context of the of the Civil War and settling the West, particularly what he calls the Trans Mississippi West, everything west of the Mississippi River. Uh, it is a book that anybody who wants to deal with the Civil War, I think, should read, and it's changing, has changed, and is changing um, the way that we think about the Civil War. I think in pretty profound ways. Twos is the Deluge is also very interesting. This is a phenomenal book. I think Twos is uh, right up there with some of the top historians that we have at the moment. Particularly this book, I think, is his magnum opus. At, at least um, I know he's doing more work um, as well. But um, I'm blown away by this book. He, uh, he is able to look at um, American politics and economics. Primarily, this is an economic history. Uh, but he does deal with a bit of politics. 
Um, he looks at America. He looks at uh, Great Britain. Um, he looks at Germany. Uh, and he looks at the, the Soviet Union and also France during this interwar, World War I and then interwar period. And it is amazing what he's able uh, to do with this book. He's able to treat um, with the same level of expertise. He looks at the Bolsheviks uh, and the socialists in Germany and the uh, Lib Dems in Britain and the Democrats in America and tells, weaves this incredible economic historic history, uh, this, this thread of economic history through, through the time period, through all these countries and how they're responding to each other. It is really brilliant. Uh, there is a thesis on every single page of this book. Every page I read, it's, it's like the whole book is underlined because I'm like, oh, wow, that is uh, pretty amazing. And in essence, what he's arguing here is that America missed a trick during the interwar period, that uh, the isolationism of America during the 1920s basically allowed the Soviet Union and Germany and Britain and France to, um, to carve their own world out with um, with because they they realized they could not rely on the United States during the time period so pretty provocative thesis um, what time period question five what time period would you like to learn more about and what book do you want to read or have read about it so in when I was doing my master's degree I studied um, the Atlantic world and it's always been a, a love of mine. <laughs> uh, maybe I should have gone into that uh, time period. It is so fascinating to think about the, the founding of colonies and how those colonies merged into the United States and how indigenous people and slaves from Africa and Europeans are all converging and creating this incredibly fluid and, and dynamic uh, world. And I love this, this time period. Um, I ended up going into a more modern sort of part of history. But one of the books from this time period that I absolutely love, and I have my students read, in fact, my class is just um, reading this right now, is called Mine Own Ground by T.H. Breen and Stephen Innes. Both are very uh, uh, well-respected and well-known historians of of sort of this early colonial American history and thinking about the entire Atlantic world and how um, all these worlds converge here in, um, in America, North America, South America, and the Caribbean. But here, Breen and Innes focus on Virginia in the 16, from 1640 to 1676. And um, I love this book because it's, it's not uh, it's, it's not told in the genre of fiction like Montaigne uh, was. This is, a, this is pure power history. Uh, they look at um, court cases from the uh, Virginia colony um, after the founding of Jamestown, and basically they come to the argument that race and racism probably didn't exist in the early period. Uh, during this time period, it Race and racism comes later. Uh, but here, for example, Anthony Johnson is a slave who comes to Virginia very early on. He's able to acquire his freedom. Um, he's able to, I think he buys the freedom of his wife and children as well. And he actually becomes a very powerful and wealthy plantation owner uh, in Virginia early on. And he is seemingly treated with the same rights as white people and everybody else. And so that's sort of the thesis of the book. It's very provocative, very, very powerful. Uh, for me, uh, this book uh, just um, really reshaped the way that I think about the world and American history. So I love this time period. The other sort of on the other spectrum, the other time period, the other thing that I dabble in that I really love, I never went into it because I don't read or speak German, although I'd love to learn how to. Uh, but this book is uh, really incredible. If you haven't read it, I suggest picking it up. Ordinary Men, Reserve, Police Battalion 101, and The Final Solution in Poland by Christopher Browning um, on the Holocaust uh, in um, Nazi-controlled areas of the Third Reich. Uh, Browning looks at post-war interviews done by policemen. Um, these policemen formed what are called Einsatzgruppen, uh, mobile um, uh, death units that the soldiers didn't 
initially, the SS didn't necessarily initially uh, run because uh, they were running concentration camps and soldiers were also at the front lines fighting. So the Nazis relied on these police battalions who basically were just police officers. They signed up to do police uh, duty and their their job description to got tra- changed dramatically and they were told that they were going to have to be executioners and some of them did it and interestingly enough many of them didn't and nothing happened to them they didn't get demoted they didn't get killed themselves nothing happened they said i'm not going to shoot these people and nothing nothing happened to them they were basically reassigned to another position uh it's a fascinating book and it's a pretty scary thesis because Browning comes away from this arguing that basically the Holocaust was perpetrated by ordinary people. Um, and of course that makes me feel uncomfortable because uh, that means that uh, I consider most of the people I interact with myself an ordinary person. So maybe these people aren't monsters so much is and more so kind of just ordinary people at least that's what browning is arguing here is pretty provocative and he does a pretty good job it's contentious this book not everybody agrees with it but uh i, I found it to be uh, very fascinating and and interesting uh a read so um something something to 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 share um Number six, what is your favorite person from history, and what book do you want to read or have read about it? Okay, there's a lot of favorite people in history, but the one that I'm going to go with is a woman from the 1850s in Kentucky. She's a slave. Her name is Harriet Jacobs. Uh, She wrote a book called Instance in the Life of a Slave Woman. Uh, I have my students read this book. Harriet Jacobs uh, is a complete and total badass woman, except it's she lives also in this really tragic life as a slave, but um, she is able to escape. Um, she endures incredible hardship. Her, um, her slave owner is always trying to uh, pursue her. She's able to escape him. She flees uh, up north, but she's always also trying to reunite with her children. It is sad and tragic book and the genre that she writes in is not history Um, she writes this as this emotional um, uh, fictional genre in fact for the longest time people thought this book was fiction because she doesn't document anything she just tells the story as if it was more like a memoir but um, it's incredibly soul-wrenching to read this book but it's an important book to read Um, and um, I think she's my favorite favorite person in history. Uh, I don't, I, I, I could never have endured the things that she did. She must have been such a strong and mentally tough uh, person. But um, uh, wow, uh, the things she had to deal with. Um, well, I'll leave it at that. And if you're interested, check out Instance of Life of the Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs. It's, it's a powerful, powerful book. And the, the, the writing is just incredible. Um, number seven, what history topic would you like to see more um, fiction or nonfiction about? Uh, two sort of things I would argue. Um, the last film that I watched before COVID-19 hit was the film 1917, which I think is a masterpiece. I think it is incredible. Um, it's a retelling of the Odyssey. And Sam Mendes uh, does this through tr- uh, the, 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 the setting of trench warfare and incredible. Uh, so I'd like to see more about World War One. There is a, a novel uh, that I've read recently by Daniel Mason, who's not a historian, um, he's actually a psychologist, but The Winter Soldier, a novel, is about the Eastern Front. So 1917, the film is about the Western Front. This book is about the Eastern Front of the First World War, and I think it's really, really well done. Uh, there's a couple of quibbles that I might have with it. It's fiction, so it's not uh, history, but um, it does a really nice job of telling the story of history. Um, so I'd like to see more about World War One. I'd also like to see more about Vietnam. I feel that although there was this great generation of of Vietnam soldiers who wrote about the war, um, there hasn't been anything really recently. I know Ken Burns tried to do this documentary on PBS about the Vietnam War. It was okay. Um, 
there was there was some nice insights that he had, but he also neglected a lot of other things. Um, and and so it maybe is a good conversation starter. I'd like to see more. I'd like to see more fiction and um, um, maybe some more um, nonfiction, more attention to the war um, by historians. Um, historians kind of always are looking at it, but um, um, but maybe I'd like to see like a blockbuster sort of reinterpretation of America during this this period of time. Um, and definitely more fiction. Um, when I was growing up as a kid, we had all these incredible Vietnam films, and uh, and it seems to kind of dropped off um, the last several years. People don't want to talk about it. So I, I, I'd like to see more about that as well. Question number eight. What non-book resources do you enjoy when learning about history? So as a historian, I rely on two very important non-book sources. These are journals, professional journals. Uh, the first one is the American Historical Review um, that deals with all kinds of history. There's book reviews in the back of this, so not only do they have scholarly articles in, in the front, but in the back uh, they keep a running tab of all these book reviews. So it's really fascinating to, um, to get this journal and um, you don't buy the book necessarily, you read the review and then, and then see if you want to buy it. They also review websites and they review um, films and um, th they, um, they do a really nice job. To be, to be f full disclosure, I'm, uh, on, I serve on the, the council of the American Historical Association which puts this journal out. Uh, but uh, anybody can join, uh, professional historians and uh, the general public uh, can join and it's a, a really valuable tool to learn about what's new and out there. Um, the second one likewise is this one. It's put out by the Organization of American Historians. I'm a member of, of this association too, but it's, um, it's called the, the Journal of American History and it's like the AHR but it focuses on U.S. history and it has book reviews. It has scholarly articles at the front but it also has book reviews in the back and they do the same thing here so it's a really valuable tool to learn what's brand new particularly from the scholarly front but they also will look at films and um, review them as well. Um, I get some stuff from Yale uh, free courses. Uh, David Blight's, Joanne Freeman's are really really good uh, there so I, I get some material from there. Uh, the New York Review of Books is really good to get uh, an idea of some of the latest and greatest that are out there. I don't do very many podcasts, uh, but the two that I kind of pay attention to is Backstory, uh, which is real professionally done and really nicely done, uh, although it's going off the air. I think they've done their last episode already. There's another one that I like focusing on world history. It's called On Top of the World. It's... Um, a professor and I think one of his graduate students they just kind of drink a beer and they talk about the latest uh, and greatest in world history they do a nice job I think and so um, I like I like them uh, number nine what's a fun history fact or quote you can share with us uh, this one's by Mark Twain I completely disagree with it <laughs> I don't think that is right at all but here's what Mark Twain said around about the turn of the century uh, talking about war dead, which is a topic that I like to research. Um, he says, none but the dead have free speech. None but the dead are permitted to speak the truth. I don't think that's true, uh, but I think it's a fascinating quote, and, um, and I'll leave it at that. That, that is a, that's a little quote that I can, I can give you. Uh, lastly, number 10, shout out to a booktuber you enjoy who also reads history books. I, I don't really know too many, uh, I don't know anybody personally uh, on, on, on booktube. I sort of came across this tag and um, I've watched a couple of people. Uh, so I don't know um, uh, a ton of people, but there's are, there are a couple of people that I like to watch uh, and I'll give them a shout out because they like to do history. Um, and one is uh, Peg at the history shelf. Uh, I think she would enjoy this, and she would do a really nice job with it. Uh, and also, uh, Bill Rutenberg at the Bill Rutenberg Library. I think he's a really nice guy, uh, and um, uh, I think he would like this. I think he would enjoy it too. So I'll do a shout out for that. All right, so that's the uh, book history book tag. 
Um, I'll see you next time.